Hello and welcome to Art 21101 Introduction to Painting. My name is Jennifer Cassing and I'll be your instructor for the semester. I wanted to make a quick video showing you what the supplies look like that I'm asking you to purchase this week. Your first assignment is to go out and purchase the supplies that you will need for the course. Then I want you to take a picture of the supplies that you purchased, send me a picture of the supplies, and let me approve them as your first assignment. So let's go ahead and look at some of the stuff I'm asking you to get. The first thing we want to look at is the paint. I definitely want you to buy artist grade paint. No student grade paint. It will definitely slow you down. So let me explain the difference between artist grade paint and student grade paint. This is Winton. This is a student grade paint. It's made by Windsor & Newton and it's called Winton. I'd like you to try to avoid this if possible. I know sometimes it's hard to find what we need and especially if you need something fast, but try not to buy too many student grade colors. The reason why is that they are full of fillers. So this being a student grade paint has way less real pigment in it than an artist grade paint. So let's say just for the sake of discussion, this tube of paint has about this much real paint material in it and this much filler. Where an artist grade tube of paint it's gonna have about this much real pigment and about this much filler in it. So what does that really mean? It means that when you go to mix your colors, if you have a lot of filler and you keep adding more and more paint together that has a lot of filler, your color gets grayed down faster. So you don't wanna to use too many student grade paints or every time you go mix a color, you're just mixing more and more filler together and by the end you really don't have great color you have a lot of filler so let's try to avoid buying the student grade and you definitely want to try to get artist grade they are more expensive but it's worth the quality of the work that you'll get in the end so on your list it talks about the colors that you need only the ones with the asterisk beside them are the ones that you have to have you can have as many as you want from there, but at least get those. You definitely need Van Dyke Brown because we're going to start with that and we're going to start with a process of removing pigment off the canvas or canvas paper to create the effect that you're going for. So you definitely need Van Dyke Brown. You at least need one red, your choice. I like naphthol red and I also like quinacridone rose. Naphthol Red is not a good mixer because it inherently has white in the tube. Where Quinacridone Red, Anthra Red, they're much better mixers, but they're also transparent, which means they're not going to cover the canvas. So there are trade-offs. Same with the blues. Prussian Blue, Anthra Blue, all really good mixers, but they're transparent. Cobalt Blue is a beautiful color inherently has a little bit of white in it, so sometimes it grays down when it mixes. It's also real expensive, but it's beautiful. You also are gonna need a yellow. I like Azo yellow, um, Hansa yellow. You can use any of those that you want. On the palette or the table today, I've just pulled out yellow ochre. It would not be your best bet for your single yellow. I would definitely go with Hansa or Azo. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna try to go out and find good paint. I'm using M. Graham. I like it. It's inexpensive for artist grade paint. And that's really important because artist grade paint is expensive. So it's one of the best inexpensive artist grades you can find. Williamsburg is great. There's a lot of different brands that are really beautiful, but you of course want to try to limit your cost too. 
you're also going to need titanium white. I would go ahead and buy a large tube of this because most likely you're going to use a lot of it for mixing. You don't have to buy black because you can mix your own black if you want. If you'd like to buy black, you can, but it is not a requirement because again, I'm going to teach you how to mix that. The next thing we want to look at is brushes. There are all different kinds of shapes and sizes of brushes. And for this course, I want you to at least pick one larger brush for applying paint and then at least one to two smaller brushes for detail. Now, I personally like flats and brights. Brights are my favorite. A bright looks like this. It's shorter and they're square shaped. So these are three of the four different size flats and brights. Now the difference between a flat and a bright is just the length of the bristle. So you can see here, they're the same size roughly, but you can see how much longer the flat top is, where the bright is a little shorter, almost more square shaped. Brushes and the shape and sizes of the brush that you like is personal preference. So you're going to be comfortable with one over the other. I generally prefer the bright, but the flat is nice too. Other brushes are the round brush. Most of you are familiar with the round brush. And they can be pointed rounds or flat rounds at the top. Another brush you might hear about is the filbert. And you can see here, filberts are just rounded at the top. So it's like a flat or a bright, but it just has a rounded top to it. They also make angled brushes. So here are two different angled brushes. These are fun, but again, not important. You don't have to have these. They also make a fan brush. You can see it's shaped like a fan on the top. So for this course, all I really think you need to start with until you figure out what you like to work with is maybe, you know, a good size bright or flat and maybe a round or a smaller bright for details. So if you could pick three good brushes that you think you're going to like to start with, that would be a great start. The other thing to remember when you're buying brushes is that there are two main types of brush. There's a synthetic or a soft bristled brush, and so when you go pick those up in the store and you feel them, they feel soft. Those soft bristled brushes or synthetic bristled brushes do not leave brush strokes. That's really important sometimes when you want a smooth finish. There's also rough bristled brushes like hog bristle, those brushes will always leave brush strokes. So if you know right off the bat you don't want brush strokes showing, don't buy rough bristled brushes. And you can feel them in the store. They're clearly rough. So synthetic brushes, no brush strokes, smooth. Natural Hair brushes like hog bristle, they are going to leave brush strokes, so be very careful if you know you don't want that. You might want to try a combination or you might want to go all smooth. I definitely wouldn't go with all rough bristled brushes to start. You're also going to need one container of medium. There are lots of different mediums you can choose. I prefer Alkid Walnut Medium by M. Graham. It's actually a fast dry medium, and it's great because usually it'll make your paint dry within 48 hours. You can also use linseed oil or regular walnut medium. The difference between walnut and linseed is linseed yellows much faster than walnut. It's a cleaner medium. So over time, your paintings will yellow faster with linseed oil versus walnut. The difference that I have is the Alkid Walnut, and the only difference in that is that it has a fast dry Alkid medium added to it to make it dry faster. 
The other thing you might want to do is get a palette knife or two. Palette knives come in all kind of different shapes and sizes, but mainly the difference in them is how much paint they're capable of mixing together on your palette. So like this little guy right here is tiny. It's only going to mix a small little pile of paint evenly on the palette paper. This palette knife is much larger. It's going to mix a much larger pile of paint for you evenly. Now, they come in different shapes. This one's got a more angled look to it. This one's a little smoother on the top. That is personal preference. You can use this to apply paint also on the canvas, so it's not really a big deal, but it is a personal preference. Then they have much larger palette knives. And so if I'm working on something really big, a palette knife like this is really great because I can mix a large pile of paint with this. And if I'm working really big, I might even use something like this, which is more of a um, putty knife from Lowe's because it's huge. And I can mix a giant pile of paint with this. Now be careful working with this because it does have sharp edges. So when you look to apply the paint to the canvas, you'll want to get a different palette knife for that. You don't want to apply paint with this because it does have sharp edges and it can cut your canvas. So if I want to apply paint to the canvas, I'll use something like this one or I'll use something like the angled. Both of these have nice angles on the top and they're great for applying paint right on the canvas. You're also going to need one pad of palette paper. You can use any brand you want. I like the Strathmore palette paper. It's got a yellow cover on it. I've unfortunately already ripped this off, but that's the color yellow that you'd want to look for. And what it is, is wax paper essentially that is bound in a container. Now here's the thing, don't rip a sheet out and put it down and use it. Use it when it's already still bound in this pad. The reason why is when you go to mix it, if it's on the just one single sheet on the table, it is a pain to try to keep it in place. So at least if this stays together, you can mix it, you can kind of be rough on here and it won't go flying everywhere. The other thing I use when I'm working large is I actually use a canvas that has a piece of glass over top of it and then I use duct tape to seal the edges. This gives me a much larger area to mix on and it's generally what I use for making big paintings. For this class though you are fine using a 9 by 12 Strathmore palette paper pad. So let's talk about supports. What are you going to actually work on in this class? I highly recommend that you get a Strathmore canvas paper pad. It has several sheets in there. It's way more inexpensive than buying individual supports. So I would recommend getting that. It's the same yellow color that I just showed you on the back of this one by Strathmore. Same size, 9 by 12, and it just has sheets of canvas paper in there. The grayer or beige side of the paper is the correct side to work on. The underneath side is a brighter white and you might think, oh, that's the side I'm supposed to work on. That's actually incorrect. With canvas paper pads, you work on the more toned or tan side. You can also use stretched canvas if you'd like to. This is a pack of stretched canvas. Stretch canvas is very nice to work on, but for a course where you're going to have to produce lots of paintings, it's much more expensive. So to save money, I would recommend using um, definitely the canvas paper pad. You can also use hardboards. So it's literally a hard piece of wood covered in gesso, mounted or cradled down. Now, the cradled part just means that it has wood around the back side supporting it. If you find wooden supports with no cradle, they're pretty inexpensive and they're really nice to work on. So those might be a cheap, another cheap way to work. 
and that would be fine. I, I really like those. But again, think about cost in the class. You are just learning, and I just don't want you to waste too much money on expensive supports. Canvas paper pad is just fine for this course. So you're going to need something to clean your brushes after you make this huge mess in your house. If a lot of you have kids running around, you might not want to have paint thinner in your house. Of course, most people, most artists use paint thinner to clean their brushes. I really like this uh, Mona Lisa paint thinner. It's really one of the few that actually has no odor, but it's still paint thinner. So it is toxic. If you are going to use paint thinner, you will need to put the paint thinner in a glass container to clean the brushes with. You cannot put paint thinner in a plastic container because the paint thinner will actually eat the plastic. So one thing they do make is a silicoil jar. I like these a lot. It's a glass jar that has a metal ring in the bottom. You fill it with paint thinner and then you literally put your brushes in here, move them around, and it cleans the brush and then all of the sediment from the paint drops to the bottom so it's really neat but again you don't have to have it for this course when i'm working in my house i don't use paint thinner at all because i have kids running around i use murphy's oil soap and at the end of the day when i want to clean my brushes i'll use murphy's oil soap to clean my brushes now the trick with using murphy's is what you want to do is pour a little Murphy's in your hand, take your dirty brush without putting water on it first, directly in the palm of your hand into the Murphy's and work up a lather. After you do this, then you can put your brush in the water and clean it off. But if you try to put your dirty brush in the water first, remember oil and water don't mix, so it won't clean as fast. So again, put the Murphy's in the palm of your hand, mix it up, get a good lather, rinse it out and you might have to do it twice for each brush. The other thing that looks works really well for cleaning your brushes is lava soap, a bar of lava soap. You can find that in the automotive section and you can just take the bar of lava soap, take the dirty brush directly on the bar of wet lava soap, just put the lava, lava soap under the water for a second and then work up a lather directly on the bar of lava soap. The only drawback on the lava soap is that it does have little pieces of pumice in it so therefore, you are probably shortening the life of your bristle by doing that, by rubbing it on something rough all the time. But it's really good, it's really easy to use. It's probably a little easier than the Murphy's. Um, and some people don't like the smell of the Murphy's. So it's an option. The other thing you're gonna need, a regular pencil. Nothing fancy, it can be your kid's number two pencil. You're just gonna use this to sketch with. The only thing is you don't want something that's a dark lead. You want like anywhere from a 2H to an H to a 2B. A regular number two pencil will work perfect for this. I'm also asking that you get a sketchbook. Here's an example of the sketchbook that I'm currently working in. This is 8x8 ring bound. It is a pentallic. Now I'm left handed so for me I always have to have spiral bound because I would always be in the corner of the book and I like the fact that I can flip this thing all the way over and work in it. So when I'm working in these, it's just a much easier thing to flip them over like this and then work. This is just a little piece I was working on last weekend. I do want you to use a brand new sketchbook without anything from another class in it or anything else because we're going to look at those and you are going to have a grade on that. I just want to make sure everything that you did in the sketchbook is actually from this semester. The other thing you're going to need is tape. This is um, artist masking tape and this is blue painters tape. I prefer the artist masking or the white artist tape because it doesn't really affect your color as much. Imagine if you have blue surrounding your support that's taped down. It can sometimes affect your color choices because you've got this blue in your face all the time. So 
definitely, if you can, go for artist masking or white artist tape. But again, blue painter's tape will work, whatever you can find. And the reason that you'd need that is when you use the canvas paper, you'll want to find any kind of cardboard support that you can. This is actually the back piece of palette paper board. And so what I'll do is I'll tape my canvas paper directly to this, a single sheet. It just gives me a little bit more structure underneath it and allows me to move it around a little easier. And I actually tape down the edges and fold the tape around it so it stays together while I'm working. And then when it dries, I remove the tape and I have a nice clean edge. The other thing you may want to try to find is a pizza box. Now, not one that's already had pizza in it, but sometimes you can go to the local pizza places and say, hey, can I get an extra clean box? Some of my students have had great success, especially transporting wet paintings into the classroom in previous semesters with that concept. It's totally up to you. Also, if you have kids, it may be a safe way for you to put wet paintings away so that they can't get their hands on them. So um, they make actual wet painting carriers and things like that, but they're extremely expensive because they're for artists. And anything for artists seems to be real expensive. So the pizza box is a great way for you to do that. So that kind of goes over the basic materials and supplies that you're going to need for this course. If you have any questions on the basic materials that we've looked at in this little video, please send me a message. And remember, your assignment for this week is to find all of the supplies that you're going to need for the course, which is listed on your supply sheet, which is posted to Blackboard. Then I want you to take a picture, send it to me, let me approve what you bought, and then we can go ahead and start working. I want to make sure that you don't buy watercolor brushes or anything that's not going to work for the course before you open them. And do be careful about buying watercolor brushes. I did not mention that. Make sure that you are buying oil or acrylic brushes. They're, the bristles on these brushes are a little bit thicker, so they can handle the weight of oil paint. Watercolor brushes cannot handle the weight of the oil paint, and they're not easy to work with. If you have any questions, again, send me an email, and I can't wait to see what you all have found, and I can't wait to see what you send me. Have a great week.